Our love is near akin unto regret. We love, and are beloved again, and yet there oft is something that we lack. So life is very near akin to death. We live and laugh a while, yet with each breath something is passing that will ne'er come back. There are hours claimed by sleep, but refused to him. Nonetheless, they are his, by some state within the mind, which answers rhythmically and punctually to that claim. Awake and at work, without drowsiness, without languor, and without gloom, the night mind of man is yet not his day mind. He has night powers of feeling, which are at their highest in dreams, but are nights as well as sleeps. The powers of the mind in dreams, which are inexplicable, are not altogether baffled because the mind is awake. It is the hour of their return, as it is the hour of the tides, and they do return. In sleep, they have their free way. Night then has nothing to hamper her influence, and she draws the emotion, the senses, and the nerves of the sleeper. She urges him upon those extremities of anger and love, contempt and terror, to which not only can no event of the real day persuade him, but for which, awake, he has perhaps not even the capacity. This increase of capacity, which is the dreams, is punctual to the night, even though sleep and the dream be kept at arm's length. The child, not asleep, but passing through the hours of sleep and their dominion, knows that the mood of night will have its hour. He puts off his trouble apart, and will answer it in another time, in the other state, a day. I shall be able to bear this when I am grown up, is not oftener in a young child's mind. I shall endure to think of it in the daytime. By this he confesses the double habit and double experience, not to be interchanged, and communicating together only by memory and hope. Perhaps it will be found that to work all by day or all by night is to miss something of the powers of a complex mind. One might imagine the rhythmic experience of a poet, subject, like a child, to the time, and tempering the extremities of either state by messages of remembrance and expectancy. Never to have had a brilliant dream, and never to have had any to do, would be to live too much in the day. And hardly less would be the loss of him who had not exercised his waking thought under the influence of the hours claimed by dreams. And as to choosing between day and night, or guessing whether the state of day or dark is the true and more natural, he would be rash who should make too sure. In order to live the life of night, a watcher must not wake too much. That is, he should not alter so greatly as to lose the sight, the visible darkness for the quiet. The hours of sleep are too much altered when they are filled by lights and clouds. And nature is cheated so and abated, and her rhythm broken, as when the lungs caged in populous streets make ineffectual springs and sing daybreak songs when the London gas is lighted. Nature is easily deceived, and the muse, like the light, may be set all astray as to the Lord. You may spend the peculiar hours of sleep amid so much noise and among so many people that you shall not be aware of them. You may thus merely force and prolong the day. But to do so is not to live well in both lives. It is not to yield to the daily and nightly rise and fall and to be cradled in the swing of change. There surely never was a poet that was now and then rocked in such a cradle of alternate hours. It cannot be, says Herbert, that I am he on whom thy tempest fell by night. It is in the hours of sleep that the mind, by some divine paradox, has an extremist sense of night. Almost the most shining lines in English poetry, lines that cast sunlight as shadows, are those of the blink. Written confessedly from the side of night, the side of sorrow and dreams. And those dreams, the dreams of little children sweepers, all is as dark as he can make it with the bags of soot that the boy.
this dream of the green plain and the river is too bright for the day. So indeed, is another brightness in Blake's, which is also in his poem.